We can go ahead and have a seat, and as you're getting settled in, you can open up to the book of Luke chapter 1. It's where we're going to start out this morning. My name is Robert Smith. I'm the junior high and high school pastor here. Uh, I'm excited to be with you guys this morning. It's my wife, Amber. She's our serve uh, and volunteer coordinator here, and, uh, and we're excited to, to be with you this morning. It's the end of our Heroes series, so we decided to be fun to wear some hero shirts. I see some of those out there. Um, and I discovered something over the summer that, that troubled me a little bit. Um, in the midst of our summer camps and conversations about superheroes and things, I found out that there's some people that don't believe that Batman's a superhero. This troubles me because, as you can tell, I'm a Batman fan, grew up a little like wee little lad, uh, loved Batman, had the coloring books, the comic books, the TV shows, the action figures, whole nine yards. So I need to know who I'm talking to a little bit here. So if you think that Batman 100% is a superhero, would you just raise your hand? Okay, you're, you're my people. You're my people. All right, and if you think Batman is just a rich guy with gadgets, raise your hand. Okay, you guys can talk with her. The rest of you are here. Those of you that didn't raise your hands and don't really care, good, because this has nothing to do with what we're talking about today. So... So we've been going through the last few weeks looking at some heroes of faith in Scripture, and we've seen uh, people like Joseph and Abraham, David, Peter, Gideon, uh, all these people that, that for one reason or another we say are heroes of faith. And we've seen some things from their life on what makes them heroes. We've seen some things that we can take from their choices and actions and decisions for us to be more heroic in our faith. And we're finishing up with a familiar uh, couple of individuals from Scripture. Today we're going to be looking at Mary and Joseph, the parents of Jesus, as we finish this hero series. So we're doing a little Christmas in July uh, and looking at them. And speaking of Christmas, kids, how many of you are ready for Christmas? Okay, 148 days. Adults, how many of you are ready for Christmas? Okay, there's a few of you. 148 days till Christmas. That's only 21 Mondays. You can do this. We're almost there or something. So, so we're doing a little Christmas in July today, and we're looking at Mary and Joseph, and, and we realize they're heroes for Mar for far more than just the fact that they uh, parented Jesus. They're heroes for their actions, their decisions that they took um, to follow God in their life. And so we're going to look at some of those and what we can do to be more heroic. So um, the first thing that we see in this is that Mary and Joseph were chosen by God. Yeah, and Mary was chosen for a uh, special task. And so we're going to look at her story in Luke 1, starting in verse 28. And it says, And he, the angel, came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Verse 37. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. And so we see Mary was chosen for this special task. She was chosen to be the mother of the Messiah. And God chose Mary out of all of the women of history for her to be the mother of Jesus. And see, God chose a specific place and time, a specific country, chose her specifically to be Jesus' mother. And this was a, a task that had great privilege, um, but it also had a lot of responsibility to be the mother of Jesus, the Son of God. You see, Mary was given a, a special task, a specific task, and we are given special tasks as well. It's not the same task that Mary had, um, but we are given tasks as well. So if you are a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, that he came down to earth and lived a perfect and sinless life, died on the cross to pay for our sins, 
was buried, raised three days later, and you have committed your life to following him, then you are chosen to serve, and God has given you special tasks. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works which God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. We can see from Ephesians that God has given each of us a to-do list. And so this list may change over time. And depending on what stage of life that you're in, it's going to look different. But no matter where you are in life, um, whether you're a kid or a teenager or a parent or retired, God has given you tasks to do um, and some way to serve in that ability. And so that's why God has created each of us uniquely with different personalities and giftedness and talents. It's not for our own selfish use. It's so that we can do those tasks and serve in the way that God has designed for us to. And just like God gave Mary the ability to be Jesus's mother, he has given you the ability to do those tasks and accomplish what he has called you to do. Joseph's side of the story is found in Matthew chapter 1. You can turn there or listen, uh, starting in verse 19. It says, And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her, that's Mary, to shame, he, divorced, he resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Verse 24, when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her, knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. See, Joseph was chosen as well, but Joseph was chosen by God for an unwanted task. Kids, how many of you have gotten a chore or a task that you didn't want to do Okay, adults, how many of you have been assigned a task or a chore that you didn't want to do? See, that's, that's the situation that Joseph found himself in. He had a plan for his life and his situation, and in the announcement of Mary's pregnancy threw a wrench in the whole thing. And, and he found himself in an issue because the situation and thing that God had called him into didn't line up with what he had wanted, what he had planned, what he had in mind. And, and you look, about, look at it and you see this whole thing disrupted Joseph's plan for his marriage. It disrupted his plan for his, his family and his life and the trajectory that was on. Um, and as well, he got now the task of raising a child that wasn't his. Something I think we all can, can recognize as something a little bit more challenging. Um, but Joseph demonstrated later, as we'll see through this story, um, a, a heroic thing in choosing to love and serve and, um, and be that hero of faith in that family. And, and know today that if, if you're in a similar situation to Joseph, if you are, are looking after raising a child that's not your biological child, you're doing a good thing. Um, all of us as people of faith have been adopted by God into his family. Um, and, and when we choose as individuals to love people that we're not obligated to love and provide for, whether that be a foster child or a stepchild or a grandchild or just some other person that comes into our life, um, we're reflecting God's love to those people and to the world around us. It's challenging, it's difficult, but it's something that's honoring to God in that, and it's something that's heroic. But just as Amber shared with us, all of us have tasks and a mission and a purpose from God to live out. For some of you, that's exciting. You see it and you're like, Mary, you're like, yes, let it be unto me just as you've said. You're like, we're going we're gonna to storm the gates of hell with a water pistol. We're going. Like, we've got this. And some of you may be like Joseph and you're like, well, is there another option? Like, is it a multiple choice? Like, do I get to pick what you're calling me to? Um, because for some of you, your idea and God's idea didn't line up. And maybe you've got an idea for what you want to do with your life and and what God's calling you to may not be as glamorous and exciting and adventurous as what you'd want, but know that that's still something that God has a plan in your life for. And if you choose to follow in that, just like Joseph, you're going to see amazing things happen through it. Yeah, and just to talk to moms really quick, um, you may not always be excited about having to raise your children. There may be days that's more difficult than others. 
Like when you're potty training and your son quite doesn't get the whole pooping in the toilet thing, you know, and so he poops in his underwear. That's not fun. That's Our not, situation, yeah, by the way, in case you're wondering. That's what we've been dealing the last week. Um, that's not glamorous, <laughs> you know. And so, but we have to remember as moms, our primary task that God has given us, especially when our children are young and elementary age, is to raise our children to love God. And so you can be a hero by being a godly mother and remembering to give your kids grace and to be patient and loving and forgiving, even when it's not fun and exciting at the moment. Ultimately, we're looking at Mary and Joseph as heroes, not just because they got called by God to do something, not just because they were Jesus' parents, but the reason we identify them as heroes is because Mary and Joseph said yes to God. And Mary said yes to God's risky plan. A lot of times we read this story and think, oh, it's the sweet Christmas story and it's so nice. We don't always realize the risk that Mary took in saying yes to what God was calling her to do. See, she risked her family abandoning her she risked being known as an immoral and loose woman and the town talking about her and shaming her. She risked Joseph divorcing her and leaving her. And ultimately, she risked her life because in that time, she could have been executed for uh, being an adulteress, for being pregnant out of wedlock. And so she knew all of these consequences, yet she trusted God and said yes to his plan despite any of those consequences um, because her faith was active, meaning that it wasn't just something that was, you know, part of the time when Passover came um, or when she um, went to church. It was something that was part of her everyday life, part of who she was. And because she said yes to God's plan and trusted him, that meant she had to let go of her plans for her life, her goals, her desires, her fears for the future. She had to give those all over to God and say yes to what God had in store for her life, no matter what the outcome was. And we see from her story and the life and legacy that she left that because of her obedience, she was blessed immensely because of her trust and her faith in God. And now it wasn't always easy, and there were mistakes that were made. When Jesus was 12 years old, the family took a trip to go visit the temple and Mary and Joseph forgot him and left him there for three days. Um, thankfully, we have never left Eli anywhere accidentally. Yes. Um, yeah, we have time to make that mistake. <laughs> I mean, hopefully we don't. Um, but as apparently, if you lose your child, that's terrifying. Um, and so it wasn't always easy. And that's the same way with us. It's not always going to be easy. We'll make mistakes. But if we choose to trust in God and follow his plan, um, the rewards and the blessings in our life are going to far outweigh any struggle that we face. And we know that we can face anything that comes because God is always going to be with us. Go back to Joseph's side of things. We see that Joseph said yes to God's plan eventually. Um, and I love the fact that this is in there because it shows us just the reality that sometimes following God's plan isn't easy. Sometimes we don't jump up and automatically say yes. Sometimes he's got he's to show up in some big ways and, and help us get to that point. Um, because Joseph, he saw his plan for his life kind of come unfolded. You know, he had his plan for his family, his marriage, his, his situation, and all that went out the window. And what I love about this is you can kind of start to see Joseph create Joseph's plan part two. And he's like, okay, that didn't work, so new plan. I'm going to just divorce Mary, end that situation, and maybe he was planning to move and relocate and do these things. We don't know exactly. And then God showed up and just completely changed the situation because he let Joseph in on the big picture. He let Joseph in on what he was going to do, not only in their family, but in the world, and, and how Joseph had an opportunity to be a part of that. And what I love through this story with Joseph is it shows us something that directly connects to our life, and that's that saying yes to God means saying no to the world, or simply saying no to other things. Because Joseph had to say no to the world, uh, their expectations on what he should do with his family and how he should treat his fiance. He had to say no to the world's expectations for how that situation would unfold. He had to say no to the world and take that hit of pride, um, take that hit to his reputation and the slander and the comments that would be made about them. Um, and ultimately, he had to say no to the world's idea of a legacy and impact. 
You know, I think about Joseph just as a guy and, and what he was probably thinking and planning for his life and the impact he would have. As a carpenter, he's probably thinking, well, we'll grow this business and seek to just have this effective business here in our community and maybe grow that out. And uh, I'm sure he was praying for sons that would take over that business and create this, this business legacy as well as a legacy of his family name. And that went all out the window. But saying no to that meant saying yes to God's idea of a legacy. See, if it was just a family business in Joseph's name, that would have died a long time ago. Yet here we are 2,000 years later talking about Joseph because he followed God's plan and got to have his legacy and the plan for that impact. And so today for you guys, saying yes to God means saying no to some other things. And in saying no to some things that probably look good or, or, or may be good, to say yes to some great things of God's plan. Um, because the enemy of great isn't bad. The enemy of great is good. And we see some good things in front of us, but God has some great things. Um, and so know that, that God's calling you to say no to some things, to say yes to his plan, his purposes, his idea for what he wants you to do in your life. Um, and so today the question for us is this, what is God asking you to do? What's that, that action point that God's asking you to do? What's that area of your, your life that he's calling you to, to change, to follow him in? What's that mission, that purpose, that calling that he has for you? Because all of us have something. All of us have something from God for that. And the question that follows that is, will you say yes? Because again, Mary and Joseph are, are recognized as heroes here because they said yes. And so we want to unpack that a little bit and, and break that up into some of our, our common situations here. So we'll start with us, guys. Those of you that are married, husbands, this starts with us. Um, it starts with us first being a hero and how we live in our household. Uh, the book of Ephesians chapter 5 says that husbands are to love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And so that's our model. How we treat and love our wife is to model what Jesus did for the church how he loved above anything else, how he served, how he sacrificed. Um, it's that love that, that happens even when it's not easy or convenient. It's that sacrifice that isn't for us, but for the other person. And so that's what God's calling us as men to do. It's, it, he's calling us as husbands to say no to the world's expectations for what a relationship looks like about it being all about us, about complaining about what our, our wife does or doesn't do or is or isn't like. And it's also saying no to the comparison game of comparing your wife to the world around us, to the other women that we know, to the women of movies or TV, or worse yet, to the women of those dark places of the internet we shouldn't be. Because none of those things will lead us to a marriage that's strong and healthy and honors God and blesses our life. So be a hero in your marriage. That's where you, you can make the biggest impact. Before your business or your career or any kind of impact you want to have on the world, it starts with your home and in your marriage. Yeah, and just to add to that, guys, know that your husband or your wife wants you to lead. That's how God has designed the marriage relationship to work. And so in that, wives, let your husbands lead your family and your marriage. And so with that, encourage them. Um, tell them how you're appreciative of how they help out or the things they do for you. Um, thank them for their faithfulness and just for being a part of your life. And know that nagging never accomplishes what we want it to. And ultimately, it just breaks down your relationship and causes more harm than good. And so be a wife that is encouraging and supportive because that's going to foster good things in your, your marriage. And and love and serve your husband without expecting anything in return. Because when you choose to serve sacrificially, it's going to change the dynamics of your marriage relationship and bring health um, and blessing to your relationship. Guys, coming back to us, for those of you that are dads in the room, um, the second place that we can live out this heroic faith is in our family. And I love that we're talking about this on a family weekend with all the kids in here and the, de the dedications and things like that. Um, but saying yes to God's plan for heroic faith means you being a heroic dad. Uh, and so I've got two challenges for us dads. Uh, first, be the dad that prays with your family. Be that dad that initiates the God moments in your household. And for some of you, that's a very comfortable thing for you to do. Some of you, it's not, and that's okay. But know that, that, that being the, the spiritual leader in your family is God's plan. It's God's plan for you to lead your family spiritually, but you 
You don't have to have a seminary degree or advanced theological training or anything like that. It's as simple as being the one in your house that plans and initiates the, the church attendance or, or service project or mission trip or whatever it is. Be the one that brings up those conversations. Be the one that, that prays with your kids at bedtime or whenever you set that up in your household. Uh, and a, a big one, be the one in your family that takes life situations and applies how to live that out in a way that honors God. Be that place of godly wisdom and, and insight for your kids because you can see the world so much better than what your kids can at this stage. So be that one that says, hey, you're going through this situation at school or with your friends or, or if you've got older kids at work, whatever, here's how we could live that out in a way that would make God happy. Um, so be the dad that prays with your family. Second, be the, be the dad that plays with your family. Um, is guys, I think it's easy for us to get caught up in uh, the, the process of providing and working uh, and making stuff happen financially for our family. That's, that's one of our responsibilities, but I think it can, can shift over too, too much in our life. But the truth is that, that your kids value you more than they value the stuff that your job provides. And the truth is that they won't remember what your overtime at work provided them with but they will remember those moments on the living room floor laughing and playing and making memories. So play with your kids. Get down on the floor. And, and I'm talking to myself on this one. Put the phone down in the process. Um, those devices get in the way of our relationship. Social media and, and the internet and, and our smartphones get in the way of, of connecting with our family. And this is something I'm learning uh, to let my phone and my notifications become neglected so my family doesn't. So dads, Pray with your kids and play with your kids. Yeah, and to moms, um, we need to value our kids' spiritual lives more than we value their academic or their athletic or their social lives. Um, because ultimately, their spiritual life is what matters and what is important long-term in their life. And so just a practical way to think about this is when you're traveling with their sports team or for a school event or just on vacation, do you make it a priority when you're away to find a church and worship together as a family? Or do you listen to a sermon in the car online and talk about it when you're traveling? Or do you just sit down as a family and read the Bible together? Because your actions and your priorities communicate to your kids what's actually important to you in your life. Uh, and that's going to affect how they grow up and what their priorities are. So are you communicating that God is a priority in your life? or just an afterthought of something that you do when you don't have anything else planned. Yeah. Teens, students, you may think that you dodged a bullet this morning so far, but, but check this out. God has a, a purpose and a plan for you, um, and he's calling you guys as, as teenagers to live lives that honor him and also honor your parents. And you're like, ah, uh, really? This talk? Yes, this talk. See, the Ten Commandments are given to us in the Old Testament. And the only one of the Ten Commandments that actually has a promise associated with it, check this out, is to honor your parents. Because the truth is that God has built our lives in a way that when we honor our parents and seek to bless that relationship, God blesses us. He blesses our life and our situation. And so teenagers, the first thing, if you want to have heroic faith, is to, to invest in the relationship with your parents. And I get right now, for some of you, that's not easy. Things are crazy and tense and difficult. I get that. Parents, you're like nodding, sighing with me, yes. Um, and some of you, it's easy. You've got great relationships. But in any case, teenagers, honor your parents with your words, with your actions, with your decisions, with your thoughts honor your parents. And the second thing, just like Joseph had to learn this, learn to say yes to God and no to the world. See, we, we live in Havasu. It's, it's no question what our culture provides for you guys in terms of decisions and lifestyle and opportunities. But all those things will lead you to a place in life you don't want to be. So learn to say no to the world. Learn to say no to those opportunities, to those choices, to those actions, to those lifestyle options and say yes to the plan that God has for you. Yeah, and ladies, dress modestly. Um, we want to honor God with our bodies and how we dress. And our culture sets the modesty standard, but our culture here says that wearing a crop top and booty shorts is modest. And I'm pretty sure having your butt cheeks hang out does not honor God with your body. So dress modestly. 
And, and this also means that, moms, you should set the standard for what modesty is and talk to your daughters about what it means to dress modestly and honor God with your body. And, and Julie taught me this little poem, so I'm going to teach it to you because I think I like it. It says, touch the sky, touch your toes. If anything shows, go change your clothes. <laughs> so <laughs> It's going to be stuck with you for the rest of the day, maybe even week. Yeah. So we just want to make it a priority to dress modestly, to teach the value of modesty to your, your daughters, because you don't want the world to turn your daughter into an object that's all about sex. So talk to them about modesty and teach them how to honor God with their body and how they dress. And then finally, kids, where you at? Give us a wave, kids. Woo! Where you at? Wave at um, us. There you go. We got stuff for you, too. Wake up. <laughs> Get some donuts after. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the first thing for you guys as kids is to obey your parents. So if you want to not be getting in trouble as much, your parents be less strict and have more freedom and fun, guess how you do that? You obey your parents and you listen to them the first time that they ask you to do something. You have a lot of power and weight over your family dynamics, so choose to influence your family in a good way and obey your parents and listen to them. The second thing, with school starting in a week, respect your teachers. Be, set an example in your class and respect your teachers. Listen to them. Do your homework. Don't talk when you're not supposed to. Don't be like Julie with the fidget spinners. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> uh, your teachers work really hard and put a lot of time and effort into helping you so that you can learn and be successful in life. And so respect them. And then lastly, don't fight with your siblings. You want a good relationship with your brothers and sisters. So don't fight over those things that don't really matter. Like when there's the last cookie and you really want it, be generous and let them have it. Or split it in half and give them a half. But you have to remember, whoever cuts it in two, the other person ha gets to choose first. Um, so those are just some practical ways um, that you guys can say yes to what God has for you. For the rest of us, no matter what situation we're at in life, God's calling us to love and serve people, no matter who they are or, or what we think of them. No matter what's happened to us, God's calling us to forgive and be gracious to people. Um, and so will you say yes to God's plan? Will you say yes to the things that he's calling you to? Because for us, it's really about the knowledge in following God. It's really that we need more information, more knowledge, for us, it's the, the application part and saying yes. And in John chapter 13, Jesus says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. If we do these things, God is going to bless and help our life. Joseph, after he, he got the dream revealing what God's plan for his life was, he got up and he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. Our hope, our prayer for you guys is that you would leave this place and as you rise up, you would go and do what God's calling you to do so that you can be a hero of faith as well. Let's pray.